<laughs> no, one more, 270. I'm not going to have enough voice left. <clears throat> Do you believe in a hill called Mount Calvary? position where you don't know whether or not you want to dance or kneel down and get humble. You know, there's a song like that, to that effect, that the magic, can I only, can only imagine, will I sing in his presence or will I just fall flat on, his, on my face? You know, you wonder. And I, I mean, okay. wow, praise the Lord for his spirit. And, um, his guilt, my guilt and my shame, all of it, sin covered it all. What sin is there that you've committed that Jesus can't cover? I dare you to stand up and name it, and I'll call it blasphemy. Jesus will cover them all. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we acknowledge your presence. We come into this house to worship you. And Lord, as we look into your word, we want to exalt you. Lord, I would that when people leave here today, their minds would be, that the, that the aftertaste that they go away with would be the sweet, savory taste of Jesus Christ. That people would leave here with you exalted, man diminished, including myself. I ask that you do your work in the hearts of these people, in my heart today, in Jesus' name I pray. All right. So turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 20. Last week we looked at Revelation, chapter 19, verses 11 through 21. And as you turn to Revelation, chapter 20, 
just a real quick review of what we discussed last week. We looked last week in Revelation chapter 19 about Jesus' arrival back to earth. And we call that the second coming. That's the, that was the second coming that we looked at. He's come the second time to the earth. And so he came once a little over 2,000 years ago. And now, here in Revelation 19, which we looked at last week, and we don't know when that will be, but it will be sometime future. could be sooner rather than later. He will come back. And he comes back to the intent to set up his earthly kingdom, to fulfill promises that he gave to David's throne. And uh, we looked at a real short battle that took place. You remember the, the birds of the air were to gather together. And we looked at how the armies of the beast and the false prophet lined up on one side and Jesus came. And the battle was pretty short. Jesus took the beast and the false prophet, cast them alive into the lake of fire. No contest. He didn't have to kill them to do it. He just cast them into the lake of fire. And then he uh, proceeded to defeat the armies that were opposing his earthly rule. And I'm speaking of this in past tense because we've already studied it, but remember, I'm speaking, this is all future tense. None of this has happened yet, but it will take place as sure as we're sitting here today. Okay? So now, without any gap, see, sometimes chapter breaks can cause confusion because um, the chapters weren't added to the Bible. These are, you know, it's one scroll. It's one scroll, but in order for us so that we can all sit here today and say, turn to Revelation chapter 20, we know where we're at, right? So we put those in for our, for our quickly being able to refer to it. But chapter 20 immediately follows chapter 19. There's no time gap. So as soon as he defeats the, the armies that we, just, that we just talked about, this is what happens. Let's look at verses 1 through 3. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3, follow along. It says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed for a little season. Now I'm going to deal with this a little bit more in just a minute, but I just want you to take note of what's happening here. First, see, Jesus is, he's already cast the false prophet and the beast into the lake of fire. He's destroyed those armies which would oppose his rule. And now he's binding Satan for a thousand years. And that's the beginning of what we call the millennial reign. This is the beginning of the millennial reign. It's a unique time. What is the millennial reign? It's a unique time on earth when Jesus is a literal king. And I've said this because we get it in our heads. We read this and we think, oh, okay, we get a little picture in our mind. But this is going to be just as real as if you turn on, and, and I've said it before, but you turn on Fox News and you turn and you see, you know, uh, the kings or, or the prime minister of Israel over there, uh, Bibi Bittenyahu, and he's, he's over there and, and we say, oh, there, there he is. Well, just as real as, as Israel is and just as real as the government is now, Jesus is going to come and he's going to set up a real kingdom on earth. It's called the millennial reign and it's a unique time on the earth when Jesus reigns over the existing nations. And I mentioned some of them last week that if they exist at this time, it could be the United States if we're around, it could be Korea, it could be... Uh, Iran and Iraq. These are nations. And you know what? They're going to serve Jesus. It's going to be a unique time. A very unique time. But you'll notice that back in 19, chapter 19, verse 15, he's going to rule with an iron hand. But during this millennial reign, these people aren't going to want to serve him. But he, being the king of kings, will rule. And so he's going to rule with an iron hand. Or an iron, uh, an iron rod. Chapter 19, verse 15. Uh, so a chronological overview so far of where we've been as far as future events that are going to take place. We've already looked at several of these, but the rapture of the church is what's going to trigger all of these events. The rapture of the church has not yet happened, and it will. Jesus could come at any time, and we will be, we will, we will be caught up with him in the air, and so will we ever be with the Lord. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4 and study it out. 
judgment seat of Christ will proceed very soon after that when we're caught up with him. He'll actually, we'll stand, I've taught about this uh, a couple months ago, that the, this will be a judgment of the believer, not for their, not for their salvation, but for reward. And then the marriage supper of the Lamb is a time of celebration. And the saints will be clothed and equipped. We've already looked at how they're coming back and they're very different now. But um, all of these things are happening while on the earth there's devastation taking place. The earth is being destroyed. Antichrist is in rule, he's in authority, and he's destroying, well, God's destroying. Uh, God's sending plague after plague after plague, and the Antichrist is crying out for, he's saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace, and he's the world leader. And this is all the stuff that's happening on earth, and, it's just, and, and the world is becoming chaotic, and it's preparing the way for Jesus to come, which we looked at last week, the second coming. These are the events, chronological events that will happen someday future from, from today forward. And then the millennial reign. Millennial reign, we look at the 1,000 year reign, unique time frame on earth. Not that God's throne is ever going to leave, but it's a unique time frame where the existing nations will, will be submitted to Jesus Christ. And so uh, now that he's come back, he's cast the beast and the false prophet, he's bound Satan, now he's able to establish his kingdom. Let's take a look at verse 4 and actually. The Old Testament sheds a lot of light on the millennial reign. But we won't get into a lot of it today. In fact, we won't even refer to the Old Testament because it's, my intent isn't really to study out the millennial reign so much, um, which is a lengthy topic to study. Um, but let's just look a little glimpse at what Revelation, this is what the text shows us, so let's look at it. It says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the, witness of, for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So where is this? A couple of questions. Those five W questions, who, what, when, where, why, we'll just answer a couple of them. Where is this? It's on earth. Jesus has come. He's established his reign. And and these are literal dominions or rulerships that he's going to give to his people. And he describes who these people are. People who have, who have lost their lives for the witness of Jesus. This could be Pastor Saeed. This could be you or I, should the Lord choose to have us go down that path. But um, this could be many throughout the ages who died for Jesus or those during the tribulation who didn't receive the mark of the beast. Which, we, which is before this, obviously. But uh, these are people that he's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Here, here, take, take rulership of, of this region. It's a unique time. It really is, the, the millennial reign. So he's going to give this authority to his, to his followers, to those who, who trusted in Christ, the Savior. Um, and let's take a look at verse 5 and see... This next verse is going to take a little bit of unpacking. It says, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now, I want to unpack that and hopefully provide some clarity for you as to what's going on here. At this point, we, we, we see this term, the first resurrection. And it's, it's referred to in Scripture more than once. And uh, it, the first resurrection... At this point, by chapter 20, verse 5, the end of the first resurrection, there will be no more raising of the dead, the righteous dead. Now I want to unpack that and say that the first resurrection is certainly in parts. It's not all just one, and I'll explain that. First, there are several parts that make up the whole. The first of all, Jesus himself being that first, the, the, uh, the Jesus himself is part of that first resurrection. He is the first fruits. And you can look up 1 Corinthians 15, 20 and Romans 8, 29 if you want to study that out. But Jesus is the beginning. It's all those who are in Christ who are going to raise again from the dead. Those are part of the first resurrection. And Jesus himself being leading, leading the way, uh, which we're getting ready to celebrate in a few weeks here, a couple of weeks. 
Um, then part of the first resurrection is all believers, dead or alive, at the time of the rapture. When Jesus comes and claims his, his church, all those who've died, your grandmother, your grandfather, who's trusted in Christ, who's been living in him, and they're, they're in the grave. Their soul has departed and went back to their maker. But their body will be resurrected. And, and Jesus will give them a new body. First, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive will, will, will go with him in the air. And so, the, whether they're dead or alive at the time of the rapture, they're part of the first resurrection. Then the 144,000 who are sealed in the book of Revelation, they're going to die during that tribulation. And they're going to be here. So they've been resurrected. The two witnesses during the book of Revelation and all those who are saved under the preaching of the two and of the 144,000, those are, that consists of the first resurrection. And he says, from this point forward, there will be no more death of the righteous. There will be no more righteous dying. And so there's no more need for the first re for the resurrection of the righteous. The resurrection, the first resurrection is over. It's, it's, it's done. And so, but those who are dead, look at the last part of verse 5. The rest, or the first part of it, but the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years are finished. But the rest of the dead now, do I have any kids from rec here? No. Any kids from Sunday school here? They're all downstairs. What is it? Any adults? Here? <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean to be dead? What is death? Separation. Separation from God. So those who are set, but the rest of the dead, those who are separated from God, they live not again until the thousand years are finished. You see two very, very different destinies shaping up for these people. Track, track it. Track the future of those who are followers of Jesus and those who choose to come some other way. There's a very different future for both parties. Okay? So we're going to, I'm just highlighting that for now, that there's two clearly distinct futures. Those who have not put their faith in Jesus Christ, they're not part of the first resurrection, and they have a very different future coming. Verse 6. Let's take a look at verse 6. It says, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection, on such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So this is further just kind of given a summary a synopsis of the, the, the blessedness of being part of that first resurrection. It says, blessed and holy are those that take part of the first resurrection. They don't have to taste the second death. And I'll define that for you. When we're born, there's, when we're born, we're born already dead towards God, separated from God. But we're going to die physically. We're going to die a physical death. But then ultimately, the ultimate effect of, of, of our sin is, is that we'll be eternally separated from God. That's the second death. We're going to see that fully play out here in just a little while. But so, the, so these terms, just to define them, the first resurrection is all those who put their faith in Jesus Christ all the way from, from Abel. You say, what? Abel didn't know about Jesus Christ. He put his trust in the promise that God was going to send a deliverer. And so he looked forward to the promise. We look back to the promise. So all those from righteous Abel all the way up to present day saints who've died in Christ are part of the first resurrection. The second death is not our physical death that we will all face, but that separation from God eternally. So we'll look at that a little bit further in just a moment. Let's take a look at Verse 7. It says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Now, you could read that and just keep on going. Or any thinking person 
would ask a question here. Why? Tom, you're a thinking person. Good question, Tom. I give you an A for thinking. All right. Why would God allow Satan to go free? He's got him bound. He's got him. God's got him. The question is, is did God ever not have him? <laughs> and uh, I hope to exalt God here in this. Why would he let Satan go free? Well, the question is actually a question that could be asked today, isn't it? You could ask the question, God, why, why don't you just destroy Satan? Why didn't he do it 8,000 years ago? Why? Why? That's a good question. And if you didn't ask it of yourself, or if you never thought of that, then I, I, you probably didn't think too long about what you just read, that God just let Satan go. And, in fact, those questions are asked today. But they're not asked necessarily in the same tone. They're asked like this. If there is a loving powerful God. Why is there evil and suffering in the world today? That's the question. And that's the question I hope to answer here, if the Lord would so choose. These are the questions that are asked. Why? Why is there evil and suffering today? If, if God is all loving and God is all powerful, and to me, this is the very most important question, because if we can't answer this, then there's a problem. Because in the day of our calamity, and it will come, you are going to waver on one of two truths. Either God's not all-powerful or God's not all-loving. And can you back up for just a second? It's the most important question, and we can attempt to answer it with two shallow answers. We can. And I hear it often. But I hope to give you a more God-centered answer. We can answer it by saying that we could just say that it's all, you know, it's Adam's fault that sin entered the world. And that's true. That is true. But it doesn't absolve God of, his, of the fact that he's powerful enough to have taken care of it to begin with and never even prevent it or stop it. Okay, I'm being honest. But that's, that's the reality. If we stop with that answer that, well, the reason that sin and suffering is in the world is, is because of Adam... Well, that's true. It doesn't absolve Adam of his, of, his, of his neglect of obedience to God's word. Or you can say, well, you know, God wanted to allow man to choose, so he allowed Satan. And so he, does it, he allows evil in the world to permit God, man's free will. And everyone's tensing up. I'm not saying anything against the free will of man here. I'm actually addressing the problem with evil, not free will. So, so relax, okay? Um, the problem of evil is the question. And, but if we say that evil exists because God wants to allow man to have free will, that's a pretty man-centered answer and a pretty uncomforting, uncomforting truth. Well, Something terrible happened to my family member. But that person got to choose what they did. That doesn't bring comfort. I challenge you that there's a more godly, God-centered answer to this question. And that in the day of your calamity, you can rest in exalting God. And I want to share with you, I don't often read stuff to you. Um, but I want to, there's a couple of excerpts. If you want the full article, I've got a nine-page nine page article and a ten-page article. I'm just taking some excerpts from that I think are quality that will help set the stage for a good quality answer on verse 7. Why? First excerpt says this. It says, Perhaps the most intense pain and persistent challenge which believers hear about the truth of the Christian message comes in the form of what is called the problem of evil. The suffering and evil which we see all about us seems to cry out against the existence of God. At least a God who is both benevolent and almighty. This is thought by many to be the most difficult of all problems which apologists face, not only because of the apparent logical difficulty 
within the Christian outlook, but because of the personal perplexity which any sensitive human being will feel when confronted with the terrible misery and wickedness that can be found in the world. There is a long story of oppression and dignity, unkindness, torture, and tyranny. We find war and murder, greed and lust, dishonesty and lies. We encounter fear and hatred, infidelity and cruelty, poverty and racial hostility. When the unbeliever looks at this unhappy veil of tears, he or she feels that there is strong reason to doubt the goodness of God. Why should there be so much misery? Why should it be distributed in such an unjust fashion? Is this what you would permit if you were God and could prevent it? That's a challenging thought. The 18th century, this is a different excerpt, but the 18th century Scottish philosopher David Hume expressed the problem of evil in a strong and challenging fashion. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he's impotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Whence then is evil? What Hume was arguing is that a Christian cannot logically accept these three premises. God is all powerful. God is all good. And nevertheless, evil exists in the world. If God is all powerful, then he must be able to prevent or remove evil if he wishes. If God is all good, then certainly he wishes to prevent or remove evil. Yet it's undeniable that evil exists. Taken from an excerpt of an article that if you want the full thing, I'd be glad to give it to you. Dr. Greg, I can't remember his last name. So you see the, 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 uh, the strain there for an unbeliever, or maybe even for a believer. Why, God? Why? So it's worth answering the question. Um, the next excerpt comes from a dear fellow believer. I'm going to refrain from giving you his name. If you want the article, I'll give it to you. It says, one of the burdens of my life is the recovery of a God-entranced worldview. But what I've seen over 18 years of pastoral ministry and six years of teaching experience before that is that people who waver with uncertainty over the problem of God's sovereignty in the matter of evil usually do not have a God-entranced worldview. For them, God is sovereign, and now he's not. Now he's in control, and now he's not. Now he is good and reliable when things are going well, and when they go bad, well, maybe he's not. But when a person settles it biblically, intellectually, and emotionally, that God has ultimate control over all things, including evil, and this, great, and this is gracious and precious beyond words, then a marvelous stability and depth come into that person's life, and they develop a God-entranced worldview. Now don't freak out on me. <clears throat> Yeah, please. The, the effort to absolve him by denying his foreknowledge of sin, as some people do. Some people will actually say that God doesn't know about the evil that's going to come, and then he reacts to it. That is very, very incorrect. The effort to absolve him by denying his foreknowledge of sin or by, de or by denying his control of sin is fatal and a great dishonor to his word and to his wisdom. God is all wise. What Hume was arguing is that a Christian cannot logically accept those three premises. God is all powerful. God is all good. Nevertheless, evil exists in the world. However, the critics overlook here a very important truth. We all must come to agree. We must agree with these truths. God is all-powerful. If we don't, we can throw the Bible away because that's what the Bible teaches. God is all-powerful. If we believe God's word, we have to believe he's all good. We can't deny those. Otherwise, throw the Bible away. And nevertheless, evil exists. And so a Bible-believing, thinking Christian will say, yes, those are true. And they will come to this fourth proposition, which is that God has morally sufficient reason for the evil which exists. God has morally sufficient reason for the 
for the evil that exists. In, in common language, God is able to see the whole picture and say, through this, I will bring about a greater good. Now let's leave the articles, let's leave humans, let's go to God's word and see if it bears itself out as truth. Go back to um, keep your finger or paper in Revelation 20, because we'll come back to it. But I want you to see this truth. This is so important. To understand that our Father is in control of our lives. It's the most comforting truth one can build their life on. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 is astounding. And it's so often read and passed over. It says, this is Paul speaking, he says, unless I should be exalted above measure, that means to be proud and lifted up, through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Paul says right here, there was a messenger of Satan, not necessarily Satan himself, but one of those demons which fell with him, a messenger of Satan sent to buffet me. Now, Satan surely enjoyed doing that. Satan surely did. Whatever that, whatever that ailment was, whatever it is he's referring to. But what was the effect? Paul was humbled. He was kept from becoming proud. God's grace was exalted. My grace is sufficient for you. And God's strength is revealed. Do you think Satan wanted any of those three results? Do you think Satan wanted Paul to be humble? No. But God says, I'm going to allow Satan to go and, and, and put a thorn in Paul's flesh. And Satan says, yeah, I'm going to do that. And then the result is Paul is humble. Whoa. God is all wise. There's sufficient reasons, sufficient moral, he has morally sufficient reason for the evil which exists. Turn back to Genesis chapter 50. You know the story of Joseph. Um, and I don't like to get into uh, verb tenses, syntax. I hate it. <laughs> Sometimes it's profitable, though. Um, Proverbs, I mean, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Joseph had come through great evil. His brothers tried to kill him. His brothers threw him in a pit. His brothers sold him to slavery. A woman lied about him and said, You're going, you've committed adultery. He goes to prison. And then look at the end of it, what Joseph says. But as for you... You thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring it to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Unless you think it's only Joseph's opinion, Genesis 47 verse, I mean, I'm sorry, Genesis 45 verse 7 makes it very clear. Psalm 105, 17 makes it clear. You can jot those down because I'm not going to stay here. But basically it says this, and people will say, people will often say, well, you know, God can make God. God can salvage the mess of your life. If you make a poor decision, you, God will salvage it. It's almost that hindsight, like, oh, whoops, they made a mess of their life. I'll fix it. But actually, that's not what the text here says, because the word God meant it. As they were doing evil to Joseph, God was meaning it. It was all the same tense, on reflective on the, on the very same verb. God was meaning it for good. As it was happening, not retrospective, not like, oh shoot, I've made a mess of my life, and somehow Romans 8, 28 will kick in. No. Actually, as that evil is taking place, just like it was with Paul, that, that Satan was coming with a thorn in the flesh, God was meaning it for good. Satan is the one who brings the evil, but God is sovereign over it, and he allows it. And it's so crystal clear, and we'll go to the last reference I'll 
But it's the Bible's full of them. I mean, I, I can't stay here all day. I got the rest of the chapter to go through. But Job chapter one, verse twenty-one. You know the story of Job as well, most likely. Um, Job lost his sheep, which is the equivalent of losing your job. Job lost his cattle, which is the equivalent of losing your savings account. <laughs> Job lost all the rest of his financial protection. Job lost his ten kids. Ten. If you've ever lost one child, you know the grief. Job was a real man. He felt real grief. Losing ten kids, not over a span of time. One day he gets this news. And in Job chapter 1, verse 21, it says, and, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Whoa! Wait a minute. Whoa. I read chapter 1. God didn't do that. God didn't take away those things. Job just said he did. Job, you're wrong. Job, it wasn't God. Get it straight. Get it right. You're about to go, you're about to be, have a book written about you. Make sure you get this right. It wasn't God. Verse 22. In all this, Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly. Job knew. That nothing could happen to him unless God, sovereign over the world, would allow it to happen. And God, who's all loving, all wise, will only allow that which is evil into our lives if there's morally sufficient reason for it. In other words, God's smart. We're not. Amen. A God-centered answer to the question that, that why does evil exist? I don't know why God allows it, but God has morally sufficient reason for it. So in the day of your calamity, don't challenge those three, that, those two premises. Is God good? He's good all the time. Is God all-powerful? Yes. And then if he's allowing this in my life, it's because he knows that something greater is going to come of it. And Satan, although he doesn't even like it, he's actually accomplishing something for God. What? Oh, I, that's praise be unto God. Because he is all-powerful, all-loving, all-wise. Satan has nothing on God. People today worship Satan and they put pentagrams on their arm and they and they do all these things. I say that because Christopher and I went wherever Christopher is. We went down to Portland and uh, there's a guy with a pentagram on his boot and a pentagram on his arm and he worships Satan. And I said, why? Why would a person worship this creature who we see his end result? Foolish. But the God of this world, Satan himself, has blinded them Blinded them. All right. Verse 8. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Not verse 8. Actually, there's a bigger reason. There's a bigger answer. More important than even this. More important than, than all of this. Is <clears throat> what is the most important? Well, what is the purpose of creation? What is the purpose of creation? Did I just hear it? To glorify God for his pleasure and for his glory where we're created. Revelation 4.11 and the whole duty of man. Ecclesiastes 12.13 sums it up. Though This is the whole purpose of God's creation is to bring glory to God. And so, what is, what's the point? Well, let me ask you a question. I wish there was a wrecked kid here today. There's no wrecked kid here. Um, well, I'll ask you guys. What did Adam and Eve know about God before, make sure you're careful here, before he sinned? Sam, do you know? What did, what did, God, what did Adam and Eve know about God? Do I know? Anyone else want to? What things did God know about? Oh, thank you. 
Go ahead, Bob. Right, he's powerful. He has to be powerful to create the world. You can't just create galaxies unless you've got some pretty good strength. Next one, Mike. He's loving. Why did I say he's loving? Well, because God could have made a black and white universe with only two flavors and, and no aromas. But look at what God gave us. In the garden, Adam would have known, wow, my father loves me. Look at this. I love this. This is my favorite plant in the world. He didn't have to make that plant. He could have just given us all petunias. But if you don't like petunias, that's too bad for you. Instead, he gives this whole big array of, of colors, of flowers, of fish, of all of these beautiful stuff. Why? Because he wants Adam to know I love you and to glorify himself. And so we know he's powerful, we know he's loving, we know he's wise. You can't just go around and speak all the sciences into the world like that without wisdom. He, he created science on, on that day. All the science that goes into light, and we're still trying to discover it. He said, let there be light, and there was light. And he said, I'm going to give all the mathematical equations necessary. I'm going to bring it all into existence like that. And now Cody goes to school and says, wow, it's awesome. We can use this stuff to make laser beams. <laughs> and, and we figure this stuff out. Well, God put all that science in there in one second. God is all wise. Those are things that we knew about God and probably some other things as well. But what, don't, what didn't they know about God? What didn't they know about God? Well, the very things that we worship most, the things that we worship most about God, we didn't know that God was merciful. We didn't know that he was gracious. We didn't know that he was just or holy or forgiving. Oh, can you imagine serving God without knowing those things? Can you imagine that? That would be... Well, there's a really good quote, actually. I think it might be in the next... Do I have a quote in there somewhere, Mike? Okay. Because the creature's happiness consists in his knowledge of God, if the knowledge of him be imperfect, the happiness of the creature must be proportionately imperfect. If we didn't know, if we only knew this side of God, but not this, and we still don't know him in this thing, we will one day know him as we're known. But, but our, if God didn't allow, see, sin is the only way that grace and mercy and forgiveness and holiness and justice could ever be displayed. That's the only way, because he needs to be able to judge sin. He needs to be able to forgive sin. He needs to be able to be gracious and merciful. Why, God? Why would you allow Satan to continue? And ultimately, it's so that we might glorify him and that we might know him better than Adam knew. So those are the reasons why I lay out to you in God's word the reasons why he didn't just destroy Satan to begin with. He always has him on a leash. So for him to let him out of the bottomless pit at the end of a thousand years isn't really that big of a deal to God. If God could say, and he's going there, just a second. Going back to Revelation chapter 20. After he's loosed out of the prison, it says, And he shall go out to deceive the nations. This is verse 8. He shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and the fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. All right, so this is the last battle, Gog and Magog. And, and all Satan goes around recruiting an army of all these people who didn't want to be under Jesus' rule to begin with. And they gather up. And what do they do? It's the same old story. They gather against Jerusalem. He still wants to destroy Jerusalem and not allow those promises to be fulfilled. And, and so then the final, this is the report. This is the record of the battle. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured. Period. That's it. All rebellion. All rebellion. Done. It's done. No more. 
And this, I believe, and some say that this is actually the beginning of the cleansing of the earth because in the next chapter we get to a new earth. God cleanses the earth and believe that this is the fire that he starts it with and goes around. But it doesn't stay there. He actually leaves that scene. Let's take a look at verse 10. It says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. You think Satan's in charge of hell? You think Satan's in charge of the lake of fire? He's going to be tormented. Tormented. Day and night. Forever and ever. And let me just bring out this one word. Where the beast and the false prophet are. Whoa. I know we just read this pretty quickly, but that's been a thousand years ago. The beast and the false prophet are. Eternity is an awful... Oh, it's timeless. It's not a long time. It's timeless. And just like Luke, in the book of Luke, chapter 16, that rich man who was begging out for just a drop of water, he's still there 2,000 years later. Right now, he is in hell. He's not in the lake of fire yet, which is different. Just like Cain, 8,000 years later, still in torment, alive. Eternity is timeless. And what we do with Jesus Christ will determine our eternity. And so, let's take a look at uh, verse 11 through 15. I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Remember that word? Here it is. The second death. And whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This right here is the most sobering text of all of Scripture. To realize that if you're here today and you are trying to get to heaven some other way, trying to work your way there, trying to be good enough, trying to hold back from some sin, trying to avoid sinning, trying to give enough money in the church, trying to go to church often enough, any of those reasons, your name is not written in the book of life. The only way for your name to be written in the book of life is to acknowledge that one, yes, I'm a sinner, but God sent a Savior. God sent a Deliverer to pay for my sins. And the story of the Old Testament is over and over. There's one way. One way. You cannot come to me any other way. And anyone who tries to come any other way, like Cain, he'd be rejected. Rejected. And so... We need to admit, yes, I'm a sinner. And I come the only way that God's provided. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. You're going to try and jump over the wall? You're going to try and impress him? He's going to say to you, depart from me. I never knew you. And this will be you. You are reading about yourself if you are trusting in some other way to get to heaven, why are you going to heaven? I'll, I'd ask that question. Answer it in your mind. Do you think you're going to heaven? Why do you think you're going to heaven? And if you can answer that question in any other way, then I'm, I'm putting my trust in the finished work that Jesus did for me, then it's the wrong answer. And the reason that we can put our full confidence and authority on the fact that Jesus is a sufficient payment is because in two weeks from now we're going to celebrate the annual anniversary of when he rose from the dead. Three days later he rose from the dead to say, God has accepted my sacrifice. Just like the priest would go into the temple and he'd offer up that sacrifice. And if the priest came out, whoa, that was good because the priest didn't die. Signifying that the, that the offering was not accepted. Jesus came out of the grave to signify that God has accepted his payment. 
not seen by two or three, but by over 500 witnesses. And, we, and do we dare play around with our eternal soul and try to come to God some other way? I ask you, this is the condition of all the poor souls who have tried to come some other way. I beg you, don't let it be you. There's time today. Today, I said this last week, if you don't harden your heart, today if you hear his voice, not my voice, if you hear his voice saying, come, come, then come. Because tomorrow or next week you might be in church and you might hear my voice, but you won't hear his. I ask you today, 